The 3rd century AD was a traumatic time for the Roman Empire. They were forced to deal with mass barbarian invasions and growing internal instability. But one of the most critical problems for the empire was the rampant inflation that had been growing unchecked for almost a century. By the reign of Diocletian, the economy was at the point that it was normal to combine payments in cash with payments in kind. In a desperate response to this, Emperor Diocletian and his colleagues created one of the largest pieces of Roman economic legislation, and it was to be displayed for everyone to see. It is now known as the Edict on Maximum Prices, and would read out hundreds of different goods and services, as well as the maximum prices at which they could be sold. This was in hopes that if there were universally fixed prices for everything, it would put an end to the constantly growing prices and profiteering. This attempted remedy might seem simplistic and totally inefficient for us living in the 21st century, but even with all our modern knowledge of advanced economics, we still struggle with controlling and predicting inflation. Obviously, the edict was very hard to enforce, especially throughout the empire, so it remained a failed experiment. However, what this surviving list represents to us today are the vast amount of common goods at that time, as well as their respective prices in the eyes of the Roman rulership. So today we decided to have some fun with this list, and dive into the lives of three real individuals who we found to have lived at that time, and who represented three different social classes. We will examine their income, diet, and the commodities that they could afford, and hopefully portray to you their quality of life. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this. The first man on our list is Theodorus, a 30-year-old man who lives in the town of Thera on the island of Santorini. According to the Roman tax reports, Theodorus is married to Euporia, a 20-year-old woman with whom he has a 2-year-old daughter named Eudoxia. To make a living, Theodorus works as a tenant farmer, which means he works on the land of his landowner, to whom all his produce goes to. In exchange, the landowner pays him a stable salary and covers his taxes. According to the Roman census, Theodorus alone works with 8.5 hectares of arable land, 2 hectares of vineyards, and 18 olive trees. According to the edict, Theodorus' salary would be 25 denarii per day, plus the daily food ration he is owed. Assuming he works an average of 6 days a week, let us see if Theodorus can sustain his family with the 150 denarii he earns weekly. For the quantities of common goods required for one adult male, we will use the Mediterranean respectability basket of historian Robert Allen. We will also assume that Theodorus' wife and daughter would together eat like another adult male. So the yearly quantities will be divided by 52 weeks and then multiplied by 2 to get an average weekly amount for Theodorus' three-person family. The most dominant food in the common Roman diet was bread. It was both their biggest source of protein and their biggest expense. Theodorus' family needed about 7 kilograms of bread a week. For this, they would need about 4.4 kilograms of wheat at 8 denarii per kilogram, which totals to a weekly expense of 35.5 denarii. And this is considering the family baked their own bread. If not, they would have to pay the local baker to do it for them, which would cost an extra 7 denarii. If needed, they could cut the expenses even more by making barley or rye bread instead, which would cut the expenses by half. Olive oil is another must in any Roman family's diet. Each week they would need about 200 milliliters. The price, however, ranged from 12 to 40 denarii depending on the press of the oil. Theodorus would go for the budget option, which would come down to 4.8 denarii a week. But a good Roman family cannot exist only on grain and olive oil. Theodorus would have to complement the diet with anything he can get at an affordable price. Beans and peas are a nutritious supplement, of which they would need a total of 2 kilograms. The most expensive ones being broad beans, lentils, chickpeas, and kidney beans all cost 7.4 denarii a kilogram, and the family could have cycled between them every day for a more exciting diet. Moving on to the vegetables and fruits, some great options include cabbage, lettuce, beets, onions, leeks, apples, and peaches, which are all sold at 4 denarii a bundle. For about 20 denarii, Theodorus could get a healthy combination of 5 of these every week. For drinking, the family would purchase a liter of ordinary wine and wheat beer at 16 and 8 denarii respectively. Regarding animal products, the most affordable options are eggs at 1 denarii apiece and cheese at 2 denarii for 200 grams. Meat and fish are luxurious items, as even the cheapest pieces cost between 6 to 12 denarii for every 300 grams. Theodorus and his family would only reserve such expenses for special occasions or butchering season discounts. With the food covered, Theodorus still has to pay for other commodities such as clothing, shoes, heating, rent, and saving money for taxes. 
For heating, 136 kilograms of firewood cost 30 denarii. But this expense would vary with the passing seasons. It would be wise for Theodorus to put away some money in the warmer seasons, just in case the winter turns out colder than expected and more firewood is needed. Clothes and shoes would have been the most expensive items Theodorus would have to buy, so he would always take very good care of them. Unfortunately, he has worn out the sole of his left sandal beyond repair and needs a replacement. The cheapest farmer's sandals cost 50 denarii a pair, but Theodorus could only afford to buy one of them at half the price. This was very common with sandals, as they didn't differ left from right. A quality tunic would be out of reach for Theodorus's family, as they all start at 500 denarii. Instead, they would have to buy cheap third quality coarse linen at 218 denarii per kilogram at the market and weave their own clothes at home. But even this would be very uncommon for them, and they would stick to repairing their clothes through the years instead. Most of the spare money the family would have at this point would be spent on tools for the house and other minor needs. In this case, they need a new pot and a sewing needle for repairs. The remaining 15 denarii would be a good amount to save in case of minor emergencies. Experts and scholars have concluded, as we have now, that an average Roman in this period was capable of providing his family with an average of 2,000 daily calories, clothing, a place to live, and even cover some secondary needs for the household. Therefore, the average Roman in the 3rd century would live better than most serfs and medieval peasants that came after, and relatively similar to 18th century workers in Europe or Asia. Even better, if the Roman pleb was physically fit and capable, he could join the army, like the next character on our list and upgrade his standard of living and social class. This was very desirable not only for the lower class, but also for the military recruiters, who, in the words of Vegetius, always preferred recruits from the countryside than the city, because they were more accustomed to cheaper diets and harder labor. Our next character is Aurelius Flavinus, a 36-year-old soldier in the 11th Claudia Legion, stationed near modern-day Venice. He was born in Illyricum around 266 AD, and enlisted in the 11th Legion at the age of 16. For the next 14 years, he served faithfully and earned a promotion to Optio, a rank he has held ever since. Now his detachment has been sent to Mauritania for an expedition. The official soldier's salary in the 3rd century was 3,600 denarii, a meager quantity of 69 denarii a week. Fortunately, the military comes with its benefits. Aurelius receives a food pension of 600 denarii plus two generous donatives of 5,000 denarii each year from the emperors. Also, since Aurelius' detachment is on foreign expedition, he and his comrades are quartered among the civilian population and so don't need to pay for a roof over their heads. The law states that his host must provide him with one-third of the house as a private residence, as well as oil, wine, and other minor commodities he might need. The only problem with his official salary is the incomplete recovery of the monetary economy, which means not all of this amount will be given to Aurelius in the form of cash. Instead, he could receive it as extra rations, clothing, or weapons and armor. It is safe to assume that only half of this amount will be paid to him in coin, while the other half he will either keep or trade in to cover his expenses for basic clothes and a diet similar to Theodorus's. That leaves Aurelius with a weekly budget of 137 denarii to spend on things other than basic food and necessities. Let's see what he could buy. This week is a special date for the unit. It is the third anniversary of their victory over the Mauritanians, and the men are all eager for some celebrations. There is no doubt that the common soldiers will go for a drink at the local taverns. But those days are long gone for Aurelius. He is now an optio and has learned to enjoy the virtues of a little private reunion with some other officers. Sharing the expense with five of his colleagues, he has bought a pair of chickens for 60 denarii, a kilogram of beef for 24 denarii, and 700 grams of boar meat for 32 denarii. This menu will be supplemented by 20 oysters at a denarii each, a kilogram of sardines for 48 denarii, and 4 liters of wheat beer for 72 denarii. Olive oil and bread will be used from their own daily rations. Finally, they will need good wine for toasts and drinking. The soldiers chose to spoil themselves with one liter of first quality wine from Picanum, which costs nothing less than 90 denarii. An appropriate choice to toast for fallen brethren, but spending everything on just feasts is the fastest way to ruin, as there must be enough money saved for emergencies. In this case, Aurelius's cloak is in unacceptable condition. Its color has almost faded and some parts of the seams are getting undone. The centurion has already noticed and warned him about its appearance, so he cannot be seen with it again. Getting a new cloak is out of the question, as even the cheapest Italian-made hooded cloaks cost 4,000 denarii. 
Therefore, he must visit the tailor for repairs. They charge him 6 denarii for dyeing the cloak, and another 4 denarii for stitching back the undone seams. Aurelius has also been saving up a long time to buy a formal tunic for official celebrations and parades. He is now an optio, and as the centurion's second in command, must look more presentable than the common soldiers. Luckily for him, the city's market is full of cloth merchants, and he is able to find a fitting tunic with purple bands for 2,000 denarii, almost 15 times his weekly income. A plain tunic without the bands cost a whopping 750 denarii cheaper. The reason for such a price difference is because purple was a highly expensive and tedious dye to produce, and was reserved mostly for nobility and aristocrats. A brighter pigment of purple indicated multiple dyeing processes and a higher quality look, so the price of purple also varied exponentially depending on its tone. For Aurelius, even light purple bands will suffice in impressing his colleagues and everyone watching him at parades. Aurelius was able to save up for the tunic quite comfortably, as all his basic expenses of food and drink are covered by the other half of his salary, and he only needed to save up and live off them for the past 15 weeks, an achievable thing for one with a military discipline. But he also needs a new pair of military boots, as the campaigning seasons were very rough on his footwear, and he hasn't received any new ones in the form of pay. A pair of quality military boots are worth the 100 denarii, almost all his weekly income, so he will have to wait until next week to buy them, if he wants to stick to his weekly budget. He also needs to buy a new cup, as his old one broke during the celebrations. At the local market, he is able to find a glass cup from Alexandria worth 24 denarii, and also purchases a leather container for 25 denarii. Lastly, attention must be paid to his personal hygiene, and there is no better place for that than the public baths. A good bath session will cost him 5 denarii, from which 2 will go to the superintendent, 2 for the guard tasked with washing his clothes, and 1 more for the bath's maintenance. As you can see, joining the army led to a better than average quality of life. Thrifty soldiers like Aurelius could amass small fortunes to spend on minor luxuries like good clothing, quality wine, and large parties, all the while being covered for food, rent, and medical treatment by the other half of their payment. Upon retirement, it was all supplemented by a large cash bonus or land grant, plus fiscal immunity for him and four members of his household. We have found that upon Aurelius' death at the age of 40, he was able to boast a funerary monument worth 10,000 denarii, almost a full year's pay, all from his own pocket. This is proof of the comfortable economic position some soldiers enjoyed after their service with the Eagles. Despite his comfortable position, higher-end commodities like golden cups, fancy clothes, or exotic food were all out of Aurelius's reach. For this, we will have to visit our last character. Our final man is Tatianus, a local aristocrat and city council member of the city of Tralles in Asia Minor. According to the Roman records, Tatianus was a rich man, owning 14 properties of first-quality arable land totaling at least 285 hectares and distributed around the surrounding villages and countryside. In total, he has seven slaves and around 30 tenant farmers plus their families to work his lands on a daily basis. To get an idea of his wealth, we must first examine Tatianus's expenses. Firstly, he must pay the land and liability taxes for his tenants, which amounts to a yearly sum of 206,700 denarii, or about 4,000 denarii a week. He would also have to pay for the upkeep of his slaves and salaries to his tenant farmers, amounting to 5,550 denarii. This totals to a weekly expense of 9,500 denarii. Additionally, large taxes would have been imposed on him periodically as contributions to the army, which would have greatly increased the sum of money he would have to pay. But Tatianus would have been more than able to pay these costs, and it is safe to assume that his weekly budget might have been at least five times larger, at about 47,000 denarii. Now let us see how Tatianus would have lived. Being a member of the local aristocracy and city council, Tatianus was expected to perform a wide set of compulsory obligations for the Roman state and local community. Some of these obligations included tax collection, maintenance of public buildings and roads, the purchase and distribution of free oil and grain for the poor, and even providing transportation, quarters, and supplies to visiting units of the Roman army or imperial bureaucracy. And worst of all, in the case of any shortcomings or failure, he will have to answer with his property and wealth as compensation. And so, his first expense this week is 2,000 denarii to fulfill his civilian obligations. It will be used to feed the poor across the province. Next, he must see to maintaining his land. The life of a landlord is not a quiet one, and managing his states and main villa would make Tatianus a very busy man. 
This week, an unexpected event took place at one of his minor farms. Dizus, the slave entrusted with farming the land, has died of fever. The situation presents a big dilemma to Tatianus, who must make a decision now to not jeopardize this week's harvest. On the one hand, a new healthy slave capable of farming costs 30,000 denarii plus his maintenance, a very expensive and risky investment. On the other hand, hiring a new tenant farmer to replace the slave is much cheaper, but it comes at the downside of having to sign a new contract detailing the obligations and status of the farmer, plus his salary and the increase in taxation if he has a family to take care of. There is also the possibility of him being conscripted into the army in case of a military emergency. Tatianus will go for the second option and pay the man his new weekly salary. When it comes to slaves at this time in Rome, they were a very expensive investment, with some educated and skilled individuals costing up to 60,000 denarii, and it would be a great loss if something were to happen to them. As such, most Roman households, including Tatianus's, could not afford to have them mistreated or abused. Instead, they would likely be treated as members of the family, with some accounts of owners even freeing and marrying them as free people. But the death of a slave and finding his replacement is nothing compared to the magnitude of work the harvesting season will require. Extra hands will be needed from among the local free peasants, and the workforce needs to grow from 37 to 64. Tatianus will have to spend some coin for the seasonal laborers and pay for their salaries at 25 and food pensions at 8 denarii a day. In total, paying them for 6 days of work will cost him 5,346 denarii per week. But the expenses don't stop there. Extra wagons, spare parts, and draft animals will be needed to transport the produce to wherever it's needed. Thankfully, Tatianus has a lot of oxen, which are enough for the job, and he won't have to buy a new ox for 5,000 or a strong horse for 36,000 denarii. He could use extra wagons though, so he hires a wagon blacksmith for 50 denarii and new axles for 200 denarii to repair his old wagon, but he also chooses to purchase a new one. The cheapest four-wheeled wagon costs 1,500 denarii, but Tatianus will buy a larger freight wagon for 3,500 denarii. Now he can rest assured that the harvest will be taken care of. But to poor Tatianus' dismay, his duties don't end there. Census officers at the capital have found the records of the region of Trales rather suspicious, and a member of the provincial administration is already on his way with his entourage of scribes, assistants, and a military escort to conduct an investigation. There is no doubt that the imperial officials are looking for tax evaders among the local aristocracy, evident by the military escort. Regardless, it is the solemn responsibility of the town's council to assist the envoy in his endeavor, and to provide lodgings, food, and any commodities the envoy's hundred men retinue might need. The town council has decided that each of the hundred councillors must contribute 3,000 denarii per month out of their own pockets as a tax to provide for the welfare of the retinue, for as long as they need to stay in the city. For Tatianus, this is another weekly expense of 750 denarii. It may seem as a small quantity, but it adds to the thousands of denarii he already pays each month as part of his civilian obligations. The imperial authority loves squeezing the local councils of every spare denarii be it in taxes, donatives for the army, or forceful requisitions. Fortunately for Tatianus, he has nothing to hide, and his taxes are up to date. Now he can finally focus on his own household expenses. This week his wife is turning 38, and he must plan a great feast for all their guests. More importantly, he must think of a gift for his wife. Clothing is a great luxurious option, with some quality garments like a silk dalmatica with purple bands costing 135,000 denarii probably a great option for her 40th birthday. For the one this week, it will be more meaningful to gift her a custom-made pala, a woman's garment worn over the shoulder. For 12,000 denarii, he will buy 330 grams of wool, which has been dyed twice in the best Milesian purple. Then he will take it to a skilled weaver of wool who will turn it into a garment for 40 denarii. For the finishing touch, he will take it to a gold embroiderer, who for 600 denarii will stitch beautiful patterns into the garment out of 90 grams of gold thread. The final product will surely be stunning, which Tatianus' wife will proudly wear in front of all the guests. For the feast itself, there will be a big expense. For wealthy Roman families, feasts were largely an expression of wealth and status, and Tatianus would have to uphold this social norm. Therefore, his food must have as much variety as possible, the more exotic, the better. 
So he sends out his slaves to buy two kilograms of pork, two fattened hen pheasants, three kilograms of beef sausages, two kilograms of boar meat, three kilograms of lamb, four kilograms of gazelle meat, two kilograms of pig liver, eight pigeons, ten quails, ten fig picker birds, three fattened geese, three hare, twenty dormice, three kilograms of first quality river fish, three kilograms of sea fish, 300 oysters, 100 sea urchins, and to top it all off as the main exotic dish, a full peacock for 300 denarii. Now that the meat menu is out of the way, the feast will need complementary items, like 3 kilograms of spiced salt, 2 liters of best quality honey, 2 liters of first quality virgin olive oil, 3 liters of first quality fish sauce, 200 olives from Tarsus, 5 kilograms of cheese, and 50 kilograms of various fresh fruits and vegetables. And to top it all off, 40 liters of the best quality wine from Piccinum, for 2,400 denarii. Tatianus would also have to hire about 4 cooks and 5 water carriers for 325 denarii to cook and service the entire event. For entertaining the guests and his two children, Tatianus decided to purchase a live wild animal. Large predators are the most expensive, with a bear costing 25,000 and a male lion costing 150,000. But for the purpose of safe entertainment, buying an ostrich for 5,000 denarii will do the trick. It is safe to say the birthday will be one to remember. Another expense on Tatianus's list this week will go towards educating his children. For his younger daughter, he will hire a teacher of Greek literature for 200 denarii a month. And for his older son, a teacher of rhetoric and public speaking for 250 denarii. Now Tatianus can enjoy a more personal expense. He is planning to decorate the hall of his main villa, and add something that will impress all future guests with his wealth and taste for style. He has managed to secure marble shipments from Alexandria, Nicomedia, and Thessalonica by paying a huge sum to the imperial administration, because all marble and the quarries they come from are property of the emperor. With the marble, he hopes to erect three beautiful columns in his villa, one of red porphyry from Egypt, one of serpentine marble from Thessaly, and one of white marble from Phrygia. They will cost him 2,500, 1,500, and 2,000 denarii, respectively, and will be about 3 meters high and 30 centimeters thick. Transporting the stone by sea from Alexandria to the nearest port at Ephesus will cost 119 denarii, while the shipments from Thessalonica and Nicomedia will cost 120 and 90 denarii, respectively. Once in port, arranging the transportation for the 64-kilometer-long trip to his villa will cost him 2,362 denarii more, for the two days' work of the drivers of wagons. Finally, having a group of four stonemasons work on the marble for 10 days and install them in place will cost another 2,000. In total, the whole project will cost Tatianus 10,691 denarii, almost a quarter of his weekly income. But the pillars will prove a beautiful addition to his villa, and stand as an example of his taste and style. We hope this video gave you a good insight into the quality of life of different societies in ancient Rome. For more videos, be sure to subscribe, and consider joining our generous Patreon supporters that make these videos possible. We hope to see you all in the next one.